Jansen Harris here with the Just Good Network, the first episode of the Final Play podcast. You guys can get it everywhere. We're giving you guys audio. We know we've done things with the Just Good Network. We're video-based, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, but now we're doing audio. I'm happy about that because when I look at it, working with Anchor, we're going to have this podcast everywhere. We're hitting on hard subjects on sports all the time. We're going to try to upload about probably once a week. But this is the lineup we have. Me, Jansen Harris. I will talk some NFL with Sean Fowler, former college running back and high school star at Archer High School in Georgia, if you guys know about that. We're going to talk about the Bills and their championship aspirations. Is this team a contender or a pretender? Do you believe in them? Josh Allen outplayed Russell Wilson last week. Did did that convince people? Remember, they have the Rams that they beat as well, too. So has that convinced you guys to look at them as a Super Bowl contender? And then we look at Lamar Jackson and the Ravens, who only have two losses this year. But people are making a big deal about how he's been playing. And if Lamar Jackson has come down to earth and maybe he's not the real deal, that's what some people are saying, but we'll see against Cam Newton and the struggling Patriots. Look at the Patriots, a team that beat the New York Jets on Monday Night Football by three points. Are you kidding me? So do you think Sunday Night Football that Cam Newton and the boys could go beat Lamar Jackson and Baltimore? We're going to have to see. And also, I have my main man, Vince Fields, to talk about boxing. Terrence Crawford, who by ESPN is ranked the number one boxer in the world. He improved to 37-0 with 28 KOs last night over Kell Brook in the fourth round. That knockout, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what's next for Terrence Crawford and who the 33-year-old might fight. Also, Canelo Alvarez, the biggest star in boxing. He also returns to the ring, so we're going to go over that a little bit more And you guys are going to get some other bonus coverage with sports as well. Sean, the Bills are 7-2. Josh Allen has been playing well. He outperformed Russell Wilson, which was a surprise to many people, including myself, even though I've been riding for Josh Allen. Do you look at this Bills team like they are a Super Bowl contender? Um, you know what? I believe they can be. You know, Josh Allen's been having an MVP type of season. Yeah. Statistically, I believe as well. Seems like his confidence has even got a little bit better, you know, since last season. He has a playoff, you know, he had a playoff berth last year. They lost against Houston, Texas, which still was a close game. Yeah. So I feel like he's continuing to grow in more to a, a better and polished quarterback. You added Stephon Diggs this year, who has, I believe, the most reception yards and mm-hmm. the most receptions. Um, you know, he's definitely, to me, I think he's a, one, one, one of the more underrated top receivers in the game. Um, you have Sean McDermott. You know, he's been building this, this Bills team up and slowly but surely getting better each season. You know, 2017, um, you know, with Ty- Tyrod Taylor, they went to the playoffs in 9-7. and seven. They went to the playoffs last year, and they the opposite of, they should most likely win the division this year. So I just feel like, you know, the confidence and the swagger that Buffalo's playing with when I'm when, when they played and beat against uh, the Seattle Seahawks, they scored on the first drive, um, you know, passing the ball and really using a no, no huddle type of offense. So that just shows the type of confidence that they have, you know, in their defense, which is Davis White, Micah Hodge. So they definitely have a lot of weapons. And Jansen, you know, um, I got to give you credit, man. You said coming into the season that Buffalo Bills was your team, might be 12-4. and four. Josh Allen can make some noise. And I, honestly, I think the only team that's in their way is the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. But other than that, man, I, I think they can definitely make a Super Bowl run. That was a huge statement win for me because that's the type of game. That's the type of game you look at the Bills and say, hmm, they're going to lose this game. Seattle's going to come back and win. Even the Patriots game, you look at it and say, they're not going to take real control of this division. But they buried the Patriots. Now they're a little bit out of reach. They could come back, but they're a little bit out of reach. And then that, another statement win against Seattle. They beat the Rams. So for some of their bad losses against top teams like the Titans and the Chiefs, they're rebounding. They're getting hot. Josh Allen, 314 passing yards per game. Sure. He's doing big things. 19 touchdowns, five picks, five rushing touchdowns. He's feeling confident. I just hope he's steady, Eddie, and could continue this. He doesn't need to get too ahead of himself, right. but I think that Russell Wilson game really helped his confidence out. Right. Now they really feel like they're one of the top teams in the AFC. When you have Pittsburgh, when you have Kansas City— I, 
I could sit here and say maybe Kansas City might be the only team that we could say, eh, they're not better than. But when I look at the job Stefan Diggs has been doing, outside of just the stats, sometimes the passes are low. He's going to get them. Getting open on third down, being that safety blanket for Josh Allen when he's in trouble, always looking for the ball, making those tough catches, proving to people that, look, with the Vikings, they were holding me back. Kirk Cousins was holding me back. And now you see what you're getting from Kirk Cousins, and you see what he's getting out of Josh Allen. So I guess Diggs was right about that. So this Bills team, I'm excited. Currently, they are a Super Bowl contender. This is a dangerous team. And on defense, they're getting hits. They might not be getting all the sacks, even though they're getting some sacks. They're not the best team when it comes to sacks, but they're getting hits on the quarterback. They're wearing down quarterbacks. We knew this is one of the most complete teams in the league coming into this season. The quarterback position with Josh Allen was shaky for many people, and their thinking process with him, should we be confident in him? Should we even trust in him? And he's showing the whole league that... He is a leader of one of the best teams in the league, and he's capable of taking this Bills team to the Super Bowl. I agree, man. And credit to what she said again, you know, getting hits on the quarterback. Russell yep. Wilson got hit 16 times or 16 knockdowns that is last week. That's the most I, That's the most uh, a quarterback that's got knocked down in the whole season. Absolutely. You know, and, and having those guys on defense like that, um, Micah Hyde, Travis White, uh, again. And, and also, man, you know, it just those games against the Chiefs, the, the Chiefs game that they lost, and um, – Got other team, but the Chiefs. It was still a close game. Though. Yep, and the yeah, Titans. And the Titans, like those games, still kind of went down towards the wire. So, I mean, I'm, I have to agree, man. I, I think the, the Bills definitely are serious there. Absolutely, we'll see what they could do moving forward against Arizona. That's another tough game. Arizona, a team that's coming up, and the Bills, a team looking to keep the momentum up and to wrap up the AFC East. It's kind of different seeing them atop the AFC East. So, we'll see if they could. Finish strong and make a, a playoff run deep in the playoffs with Sean McDermott leading it as the head coach. I'm Jansen Harris here with the Just Good Network, joined by me, Sean Fowler. Remember, your future media, that's who we're sponsored by. And also, we're here at the Level 1 Game Room. Finish like, 10 and 6. Do you think they kind of at least gets a 500 under Raheem Morris? I believe... I believe they can. Um, you know, the Falcons, we've seen the turnaround that they had last year. They yep. they were, I think they were 1-7, and seven, then, and then I won the last six out of eight games. Went to 7-9. and nine. You know, and, and it is a new year, but the Falcons, they have the talent. And I think this is what makes a lot of the fans upset because they have the talent. They're winning games. They're not necessarily trailing in a lot of these games. They're winning, but they couldn't close. And we've seen against Minnesota, they closed. They blew them out. We've seen, um, you know, the uh, the last game against Detroit. One more play. They, they could have won that game. And I figured they could be a Carolina team because, you know, NFC South rivals and, and you know, it's always going to be a close game. But the Falcons offense is always clicking. That's what happened last night. So but as, as far as them winning, going eight and eight, I could see them losing two more. Definitely. I could see them going four and 12, too. You know, but the Falcons, um, you know, they still have the Chiefs on their schedule. They have the AFC West this year. They have the, they're playing the Broncos this Sunday. So, I, I, you know, they can win those games. But I've always said this, even since the Michael Vick days <laughs> uh, for being a Falcons fan, the Falcons can compete. Against anybody, they can win, but they also can lose against anyone. So can they go 8-8? Eight eight? I believe they can because that's still giving them two more games to lose. It's still a dis- disappointing to see them have to go 8-8 eight eight when, the- when, the- when they could be a 6-2 and two team, I believe, or a 5-3 and three team at least. But um, I-, I believe they can go 8-8 eight and, eight and, you know, have a 500 season. Yeah, it's going to be tough, Sean, because they have the Bucks twice. We see they have the Saints twice. They have the Chiefs on the schedule. The Raiders, we don't know what the hell to expect from the Raiders. Let's just keep it real. They're like, eh, right now, we can go either way. But it's going to be tough for the Falcons because this is a team you don't know what to expect from them. I don't know if the defense will continue to play well. They played well so far the, under Raheem Morris, a little bit more aggressive, some blitzes. But the offense at times looks like, eh. So I don't know if they could be a team like the Chiefs or the Bucks right now. They're striving for the playoffs. They're hot right now at f- five and two. You have the Saints looking to win the division, looking to keep that offense rolling, looking to keep their defense consistent. So it's going to be tough for the Falcons. Not many gimme games on that schedule. So Matt Ryan's going to have to be clean, maybe even hero, a little bit of hero ball. Julio Jones is going to have to step up, score some touchdowns. We know he's a big yards guy, big catch guy, but score some touchdowns. Hayden Hurst, we have to see him with some big time games. Calvin Ridley, we're going to have to see how that ankle is, Sean. But if he's healthy, he's going to need to play well too. And Don't make me go down that whole roster. Gage. Gage at that third wide receiver part. Let's see what Russell Gage could do. We've seen him spark up in the beginning of the season. 
season. We'll see if that could continue. And Todd Gurley, eight rushing touchdowns. Got to be proud of the guy. But can he put together some maybe 80 to 100-yard games and be more of a factor out the backfield? So I don't know. I think it's going to be tough, Sean. Right now, to me, they look like a 6-10, and 7-9 and nine team, which that kind of sucks because a lot of people thought they would be a 10-6 and six to 11-win team. So either way, it's a disappointing season. But I don't think they get to the 8-8. Eight and eight. Any final comments on this? Um. I mean, again, I, I can playing the Bucks twice and the Saints. I yeah. think they will at least split with the Saints. I can see them splitting with the Bucks as well because they split with the Saints last year. Although, again, it's, it's a, you know it's a whole other year. We don't know what Michael Thomas. He could be out for the whole season. It's always something coming up new. Manuel um, Sanders. Hopefully, he does recover from from the COVID. You know, so the Saints. Um, I can see them splitting with the Saints. The Bucks bringing Antonio Brown in. I have to see what. Um, uh, I have to see how he's going to fit in with the offense. And Absolutely. The the health of uh, Chris Godwin and whatnot. So, the fi- I, I think they'll split. I think they'll split uh, with those two teams. But um, eight and eight, it's, it might be a reach. But but um, hopefully, hopefully they get it done. Jason Harris back with the final play on the Just Good Network. I told you guys we're going to be talking to Vince Fields a little bit later on about boxing, but we're also bringing in Coach Vinny the Vortex from the Real Big Boxing Jimmy has over twelve years experience. He watched the Crawford Brook fight, the fourth round knockout. Terrence Crawford looked impressive. Coach, I want your thoughts on what you've seen in that fight. Well, I really, it looks like he knocked him out with a jab or a cross. It was really a, a hard to figure out what kind of punch that was, but it, it was a lot of power. Whatever, it, even, even for a jab cross like that, it was a lot of power. And I'm surprised about how strong he is. Absolutely. And look, there's some of the replay right here. It, it was like it was out of nowhere. The first three rounds, it kind of looked like he was feeling him out. And Brooke had some success, but it's like he baited him into walking into, what was that, a right hand, a turning right hand, or a short, a short hook? That's what it looked like. And it looked like it was all she wrote. It didn't even look that powerful to me. But and then you see him finishing him right there to get the fourth round knockout, his 28th knockout of his career. Do you think he was baiting him the whole time? It didn't look like a big power shot to me. No, he was having problems with range in the first couple of rounds. And um, then then he started getting a little closer. And it was just kind of weird how, how he knocked him out. So it looked, seemed like it was an easy knockout. It, shouldn't, it seemed like he didn't hit, throw that hard of a punch for him to go down like that. It was a jab and crust. Yeah. N- people don't normally get knocked out with a punch like that. Do you think he just knew, Crawford just knew he was the better fighter coming into this one? He, he looked like he fought with a lot of confidence. First couple rounds, like we said, it looked like he was patient. Even he got hit with a couple shots of the jab for Kel Brook. you think that was the case in this one? Yes, I think, I think so. I, I think he was just trying to find the range. He was trying to find range, and I think – did he – did he turn to Southpaw before he knocked him out? Yeah. yeah, and I think that's what it was. He was trying to find range, and we went to Southpaw. He cut the range, and it was perfect for that jab hook. Okay. Also, I, I want to ask you, we heard what Bob Arum was saying. Does Sanders Crawford look like some of the great welterweights back in the day? Do you think he's on that type of level, or do you think it's just a lot of talk and he has a lot of I think I. I think it's a lot of talk. Sugar Ray Leonard, I think, might be a little too fast for him, and Thomas Hearns might be a little too big for him. Okay, so if you put Crawford against those guys, you think there's no way they would win? No way Crawford would win. No way Crawford would win. He's no, not on that no, level. I think yet. Hearns is just too big for him, and I think Leonard was just too fast. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Jansen Harris here with the final play on the Just Good Network. Joining me is Coach Vinny the Vortex. Check out his content. He has a lot of stuff coming out. Also trains fighters each and every week. So hit him up and you could be trained by him. Jansen Harris back here with the final play on the Just Good Network. I told you guys I would have Vince Fields on to talk about these boxing fights. Now Vince... We know how in-depth you go on the boxing, and you always give great commentary and a lot of great comments. What were your thoughts on the Brooke Crawford fight? The Brooke Crawford fight, well, first and foremost, I appreciate you for having me. Um, but it was, depending on how you look at it, it's, it's, it's very telling because styles make fights. And if you look at the the first four rounds three of them 
are arguably the pointing in the, the fact that Brooks won those rounds. He controlled those fights because Bud could not find his range. He made it hard. And what a lot of people didn't catch is Bud came out in a southpaw stance, or normally he does. But this one, he started orthodox. And he didn't make the change until the fourth round because that that right hook kept landing against him in the first three rounds. It wasn't until he changed the southpaw in the fourth round that he was able to nullify Kell Brook's jab and that that following right hand. Absolutely. Absolutely. The crazy part too, man, was it didn't even look like a power, like it was a power punch because it looked like a mixture of a right hand and a hook. That's what it looked like to me. But I, I guess he had a lot of more power than what Brooke thought. I thought Brooke actually, he did well with his jab. I love the way he was jabbing in, in the beginning. And I think his eye was puffy in Crawford's a little bit. I thought he had a little bit of success, nothing crazy, but it looked like Crawford figured him out. Did you did you like Brooks' jab that he was using in the early rounds? I, I I did, and to add a little something to that, and this is something most people don't know about Crawford. He has no game plan, or I won't say game plan. He has no. He doesn't really come in there with a set strategy. He has an idea, but this is why, if you notice, the first two to three rounds, Bud starts off slow. And he makes the adjustments the later on in the rounds uh, as the fight continues. And it's hard for fighters to make those adjustments. Now, Kell Brook did, if you notice, with southpaws, southpaws want to keep their, their lead foot on the outside so that way they can counter and, and, and circle and they're able to counterpunch better. Kell Brooks didn't catch that because the fourth round didn't last that long. But in the first three, he, he was able to control the pace and the distance with his jab. If you notice in the fourth, the, that that hook that you that you talk about, it was a it was really a check hook, and Kell Brooks never saw it coming. That's what hurt him and dropped him. And after that, it was history. Absolutely. Now, let's talk about, you mentioned before we even got on air, before we get to Bob Arum's comments, let's talk about Andre Ward talking about it would be quicker work with Spence than it would be with Brooke. Why do you think he said that? No, see, it was, now he, Andre Ward was asked a question um, by a, a source Asking in the interview, asking would he uh, get Errol Spence out out of the gate faster than Kell Brooks? And Andre Ward shut it down and said, "You know, I really don't get into all of that styles make fights because it took Errol Spence eleven rounds to get him out of there. It took Bud four. It took." Triple G, six. But you also have to look at where these fighters are in their careers. When Errol Spence fought Kell Brooks, that was his first world title. So, Bud had been the title holder for quite some time. So, the mentality and the mindset are different. Now, Bob Arum is going to ultimately, I believe, lose Bud if he does not make this fight with Spence because Manny Pacquiao yes it's a, it's a it's a big money fight but Manny Pacquiao is a shell of what he used to be you think so even after the even, even after the Keith Thurman win you, you don't think he's one of the top guys out here even after defeating Keith Thurman Keith Thurman to me is a, a joke <laughs> Thurman, in, in my opinion, 
had two debatable fights with Sean Porter as well as uh, Danny Garcia who Errol Spence is about to fight so in, in my opinion what did Thurman do to deserve that fight against Manny Pacquiao that, that's, that's the question I feel you I, I think and, and I don't want to get too off topic me I, I disagree a little bit I, I, I love Keith Thurman's resume I thought the Sean Porter fight could have went either way. I thought he was the aggressor in the Danny Garcia fight. But going back to the Bob Arum thing real quickly is Bob Arum, he came out and said a lot of different things. I personally don't think the Manny Pacquiao fight is going to happen because they both were on top rank. And that fight was talked about, but it didn't happen. I don't think Manny Pacquiao's interested. I don't know if the money's there. I don't really believe them saying this fight would have happened if it wasn't for the pandemic. Now, there probably is a lot of pressure on the Bob Arum to make that fight with Spence. And I 100% agree with you. Who do you think has the edge right now if they were to fight Spence and Crawford? And e do you even think this fight happens in 2021? Um, if it's going to happen, it'll happen either 2021 or mid to late 2021 or early 22. And it's the only fight that makes sense because the other fighters that you have in this in this division have been ran through by the likes of Spence, the likes of Bud, and the likes of Manny Pacquiao. So if Pacquiao fights Spence, I think that's a career-ending fight for Manny Pacquiao. He fights Bud. I think that's a career-ending fight for Manny Pacquiao. So, you take Manny Pacquiao out of the equation, you have Bud and you have Errol Spence left to fight each other. Unless Errol Spence says, okay, I'm going to vacate my titles. This fight with Bud's not going to happen. I'm gonna jump and wait and go fight. Wow, that's that that's a lot. I I, I would assume he should clean out and, and have and finish out each other. They both need to fight. I'm basically trying to say, but we'll see, man. How the bo boxing politics go? Speaking of politics, let's talk about Canelo real quick. Fifty-three, one, two draws. He'll be back in the ring either the 18th, 19th, or 20th of December against Caleb. Mondo Smith, he's undefeated at 27-0. and 0. He's considered one of the top guys at 168. He beat his older brother back in 2015 via TKO. They both fought Rocky Fielding. Alvarez knocked him out in 2018. And we've seen Smith also knock him out. He did so in, what, 2016. So, what are your thoughts on this matchup? Do you, do you like the fight, or do you think Canelo should have went a different direction? I don't personally like the fight because for me it's a it's a fluff, it's a filler fight for Canelo. Canelo needs to fight Charlo. That fight had he has been running from, and that's a fight that Oscar De La Hoya does not want for him because it is a dangerous fight. Oh, okay. According, and I've seen it, you might have seen the interview. According to Oscar De La Hoya, and again, I'm not saying this is true, because it might be a lie. He says that he offered Charlo $7 million to fight Canelo Alvarez. Do you think there's any truth to that at all? As I, I remember him saying he offered him that money, and, and basically Charlo turned it down. Um, I do remember seeing reports on that, but... $7 million, that, you're, you're talking to somebody who is a two-division champion in, in Charlo. He cleared out 140 along with his brother, then moved up to 147. 